it's a gypsum plaster that's white and it's quite beautiful. This is a clay plaster. Clay based, um, Kaolin, it comes from Georgia. You can also find it in northern New Mexico. You can find it virtually anywhere in the country. And so it's an excellent alternative. People are used to having white walls or lighter colored walls. And this is all earth, earth, sand, and straw. So it's a good alternative. Here's the regular mud from this area. Um, it's the color that people usually assume uh, a mud plaster is. And here's uh, the kaolin based clay plaster also a mud plaster, and you can see the difference between the two. They're pretty dramatic. Um, and you can even mix the two if you want a, a, a buff or a creamier color on the white. You can add a little bit of the brown. This is a stationary weed whacker or a garden mulcher, and I'm just going to connect the garbage bag to it, and the straw will go through this into the bag. And this will be our first chop through. Then we'll take it out and put it through again for the fine straw that we need for the finished plasters. The straw really needs to be good, clean straw. And you can see we've got some of that here. And we also have some mold that's starting up. That This has gotten wet and it's molded. And we really don't want that in the finished plaster because you can get moldy finished plaster. And that's a real drag. So <laughs> we're going to start with good, clean straw. And we've got a bale down here. There's one end that's moldy, so I'm going to avoid that. But the rest of it looks really good. And I'll turn this on. Now, uh, we've got some coarse ground straw here. Okay. There we go. And you can see the consistency there. It's still got some pretty big chunks in it, so we're going to put this through again and uh, come up with another finer version of this. Okay, we're starting with round two here. Okay, let's take a look at what we've got here. Oh yeah. It's a much finer uh, straw that will really look nice in the finished plasters. Good. So we're ready to go here with straw. We're ready to start talking about the materials. Here we've got 60 grit silica sand, white silica sand. You can use a 70, you can use a 90, you can even use a 30. Um, and if color is important to you, if you want to get a really good clean color, you want to make sure that you have a really good white sand. And this is a beautiful white. Sometimes it's hard to find this. You can also window screen regular mortar sand, and that will work perfectly well. You won't get as fine a polish on your, on your finished plasters, but it works perfectly well. And here we've got a white kaolin. This is a pottery clay. You can buy it at any pottery store. Uh, the kind we've got here is called Tile 6, but you can also use an EPK or a DB float. And again, the thing you want to watch for is just that it's white and that it's kaolin. Kaolin doesn't expand and contract a whole lot, so it also doesn't crack a whole lot. And that's really great for a finished plaster. Makes it very easy. And we'll also be adding a few handfuls of the double chop straw, which is nice and finely cut. So um, we'll put in a few handfuls of that. And our last ingredient, let's bring this down here, wheat paste, which have gone in the other plaster. It's a good binder, um, good uh, adhesive strength for the wall. Um, makes it not dust, which is really important. Um, finished plasters or any kind of plaster can be really dusty, and you really want to avoid that. So I think we're set for materials and we can start loading into the mixer. We're going to use about 60% sand and 40% clay with some straw and the flour paste thrown in. You can go one to one uh, for the sand and the clay, but uh, we're going to go with a little bit higher sand content on this. So uh, I'm 
When I'm doing finished plasters, I like to use buckets to measure instead of shovels because I can get a really accurate measurement. And when I'm working with color, that's really important. So, uh, now we're going to add the clay. And again, you want to be pretty careful with your measuring here. Make sure they're nice full buckets. We're going to add to that one bucket of straw. Um, you can add more. You don't have to add any at all, but it does add a really beautiful texture to it. So we're going to add that one bucket. Okay, and then we have flour paste. And we're adding about, this looks like about a cup and a half, maybe two cups here. And this is, uh, you could add, again add more. Uh, some clays don't like flour paste at all, so sometimes you can't add any. It'll uh, drag your trowel all over the place, but this is what we're using on this recipe. Okay, and we're ready to dry mix. So this mixer is really full of a lot of dry stuff, and when we add water, the, it will seem to just shrink down. But at this point, it's going to kick up a lot of dry stuff, dry powder, if we start turning it on. So, this is the perfect tool for this job. It helps keep all of that dry material inside. Basically, you want to make sure all of the dry ingredients in the back that tend to sink there, the sand, is all mixed up with the rest of the materials. Now that we've got our dry mix ready, we'll start adding water. And the best way to do that is with the hose. A lot of people would like to know, well, how many buckets of water? And that will always shift a little bit. It's better to just understand the consistency that you're looking for, uh, and then you can get that every time. While this is uh, mixing and it's still fairly dry, I'll just keep the hose on full. And then once we start getting to a place where it looks, oh, you can see it shifting there. It's turning into little balls. And this is the point where it's easy to add too much water. So a little bit at a time is best. We're looking for something about the consistency of chocolate mousse, believe it or not. Okay, so let's check the consistency here. Oh, it's lovely. It's, you can tell it's pretty light. I think I want it a little bit wetter. Um, but you know, if you're not sure, the best thing to do, and I do this a lot, is just to go throw some on the wall and see how it trowels out. Okay, so we're going to put a little test batch of our finished plaster on the wall. And I usually do a bunch of test patches, both to check the color and to check the texture and how good it stands up when I'm rubbing it and make sure it's good and solid. And the first thing I'm going to do is spray down the wall. And uh, I always wet down the previous coat before I put on a fresh coat. Uh, it helps it bind the next layer to it. And so I really prefer the, the, uh, the wet wall to work on. And then I'm just going to take a bit of this. Ooh, that's lovely. It goes on beautifully. It feels like icing a cake or something. And we actually do have a fair amount of straw that you can see in there. We'll have to buff it in order to actually see it. The plaster's all mixed and we're ready to put it on the walls. Uh, there were a few things we needed to do first with the wall. Um, masking is one of them. We cleaned off all of our edges and masked it down so that we'll get a nice sharp edge. And so we're ready to put the plaster on the walls now. So have all of your plaster ready that you'll need for this wall before you begin the wall. So you're just ready to blast it out there and you don't have to worry about running out of plaster. I'm going to start up at the top on the far edge of the wall. I'm using a, a plant sprayer to spray down the wall so that I don't get a whole lot of water over everything else. First I'm just going to get some mud on the wall, and then I'll come back and smooth it over. And it's just good to come from different directions, really work the plaster into the wall, and watch those seams. And then I will 
leave some trowel marks in here and I'll leave some texture in here and I'll come back with the plastic yogurt lid and uh, really smooth it down nice and nice and beautiful. Yeah. So I'm grabbing just a little bit of plaster on my yogurt lid and running it down the corner with real light pressure and it just makes a beautiful smooth round that I couldn't possibly get without that yogurt lid. Also on this outside corner, the yogurt lid is also good for creating, a, again, a smooth round. Okay, now that we're almost have enough plaster on the wall, we can start smoothing it out. So I've just wet this uh, piece of plastic down a little bit, and then I'm going to drag it along the top. Let's see if I can get this right. It takes a little... There we go. It's starting to look good. But, you, you know, you can see, you just, this is not a curve you could do uh, with a trowel. It just would be impossible to get all of those different angles looking right. And with the plastic, you really get a nice round curve. You know a wall is ready to buff when it's not tacky anymore. It's still wet, but not tacky. So now I'm starting to buff a little bit harder, and it's really uh, using more pressure, and it's sealing up all the pores in the wall so that it uh, becomes really smooth and very stable. And uh, at this stage, you can press really hard, and uh, some stuff will come out and some stuff won't, but <laughs> it's always a surprise to know what will end up looking nicer. It definitely... Uh, makes the wall feel more smooth the more you buff it. So we've got the uh, masking off, all the plaster is on and buffed, and uh, we just have a little bit of cleanup to do here along the bottom and the top, and uh, the wall is looking beautiful. The mud we're using for the final finish coat of mud plastering is a lot soupier than it was for the initial coats, and this allows it to go on a lot smoother since we're only putting it on about a quarter inch thick. I'm bringing the thickness of the mud just about to the same thickness as the stucco down below. I'm filling in the gap that was there. For the bullnose corners, I'm just lightly loading the side of the trowel, quickly putting it in and then throwing it across the curve. In contrast to the fine detail work on the interior walls, the exterior mud plastering is done with broad strokes using only a pool trowel. It's best to have at least two people at this stage, one applying the mud and the other smoothing it out. Long strokes are used from multiple directions. By the time you get to the final coat, you're very proficient at applying mud. Again, as it starts to dry up a little bit, easy to smooth out. So you come back. As the mud sets, I continue to work it with a trowel and apply quite a bit of pressure, working out all of the trowel marks. And you continue to work it until it meets the aesthetic that you're looking for. As you can see here, as the mud dries, it becomes lighter in color.
All the fine detail work is done, and the last coat of mud has been applied. The house is finished. I really love the way this home turned out. It just has this great feeling to it that you can't convey with pictures or video or anything else. It just has an essence to it that feels so comfortable. I think aesthetics needs to be put into the forefront of green building design. Whether you're designing a single family residence or an office building, the aesthetics will give the immediate feeling as to whether the entire structure is working or not. This becomes part of the form and function, or how well the building serves its occupants. If a building is going to last a long time, it should look good and make for a pleasant living and working environment. I have rocks in my floor. I use rocks for my steps. I want things to last. I want the outside to be inside. I want to be able to walk through my door with lumber and hit the door jam and put a nick in it and go, oh, isn't that nice? You know? <laughs> Change the whole attitude about living in your dwelling. The dwelling is an organism that you should enjoy every minute and not worry about what you did to it wrong. We are rapidly destroying a lot of our natural environment. And if we're going to do that, we need to make sure that what we build in its place will be well-designed, aesthetically pleasing, and highly functional. In the past, it was never thought to really super-insulate a building, because why bother? You just put in a larger air conditioning system and just blast that hot air out. This is changing. And this house, in the peak of summer, it might be 100 degrees outside at 3 in the afternoon, this house is generating over 900 watts of electricity and basically the only thing running inside the house is the refrigerator that comes on and off occasionally like any refrigerator. There's no air conditioning system. So actually at peak demand, when the house down the street has its air conditioning running full blast just to keep the house comfortable inside and using its maximum amount of electricity late in the afternoon, this house is using an absolute minimal amount of electricity and generating its maximum amount of electricity. And the best part is, you can have this kind of efficiency with a house that is also a really great place to live in. It's a hybrid house, which means that you get the best of both worlds. The aesthetics of using green and traditional materials combined with high technology for efficiency and clean energy generation. And how can you do better than that? The purpose of building this home was to see what was possible when designing with a clean slate, free from pre-existing rules and precepts. What if we could design a house that could absorb sunlight, and this would keep it warm in the winter? What if the roof generated more than enough electricity to run every appliance in the house? What if we took advantage of the cool night air to keep the home comfortable during the hot days of summer? What if the insulation material we used grew in a field and, when stacked like oversized blocks, made beautiful thick walls with a minimal use of wood? What if a durable wall plaster could be dug out of the ground and then applied in a rainbow of colors without the need for paint? And what if these materials were easy to work with and naturally gave way to elegant forms and textures? This home was built by utilizing the best of all available materials and by making decisions based on getting the most out of form and function. It was designed by thinking about what was truly needed and, when necessary, discarding conventional building systems in favor of more innovative solutions. Creating this house was an attempt to move closer to how our planet works. Like nature itself, this is design with cause and effect in mind. This is building with awareness.